oft hat ein Seufzer deiner Harfen flossen. Ein süßer, heiliger Akkord von dir. Den Himmel bessere Zeiten wir entschlossen. Du holde Kunst, ich danke dir dafür. Du holde Kunst, ich danke dir. Oh. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023-2024 academic year. I'm Andrea Capizzi, Chair of Faculty Senate, and in my role, it is my honor to open this year's Fall Faculty Assembly. Before we start, I would like to express our gratitude to Blair faculty members, to Sean Burton, and So Yun Kim, who played for us today. It is such a gift to be able to experience their beautiful music. Let's give them another round of applause. <laughs> Along with Tammy Hoyt, Vice Chair of Senate, we look forward to serving the faculty this year. Tammy and I first want to thank past Senate Chair Rebecca Swan and past Vice Chair Liz Catania for their strong leadership and phenomenal mentoring last year. <laughs> this year, we will be joined by Alyssa Hare as Chair-Elect and Peter Kolke as Vice Chair-Elect. Alan Wiseman has graciously agreed to serve as parliamentarian for us this year. Many, many thanks to our executive committee. Stacey Andrews, our administrative coordinator, will be continuing to help keep us organized. Good luck, Stacey. <laughs> to start off, I'd like to share a bit about myself and why I am so honored to be in this position this year. As an Army kid, I was fortunate to live all over the country and several places internationally. I moved every couple of years when growing up and I attended four different high schools not due to poor behavior, I promise. That constant moving around changed when I first came to Vanderbilt as a master's student and then returned for my doctoral work and have been fortunate to stay on as faculty. Continuing my career here in the Department of Special Education, training the best teachers in the world to work with students who have significant learning and behavioral needs has truly fed my heart and my soul. I've spent almost half my life on and around this campus my children grew up playing on the lawns, attending sporting events, and as they got older, even studying in the libraries. Vanderbilt feels like a home, and the faculty are the lifeblood of Vanderbilt, and in many ways, my family. So I'm happy to participate in our shared governance model to support my faculty family and to ensure that their views are heard and considered. The Senate is the representative body of the faculty and we encourage you all to participate in our shared governance. This slide shows the makeup of the Senate along with our various committees. Last year, Faculty Senate engaged in numerous efforts such as updates to the faculty manual, continued work related to clinical research practice and lecture facu faculty, also known as CPRL, because as we all know, we love a good acronym and working with the chancellor and provost to better define the terms and expectations when a department moves into receivership, along with many, many other things. The executive committee met with and will continue to meet with the chancellor and provost to work on efforts important to the faculty. The executive committee um, has spent quite a lot of time ensuring that our voices are heard. During this sesquicentennial celebration year, we appreciate and celebrate the incredible rise of Vanderbilt as a top tier university. Without the faculty, this would never have been possible. Over the past year, the executive committee listened to stakeholders across the university and medical center. Faculty morale came up repeatedly. We also heard it in committees from school council chairs and from individual faculty. Each year, the Senate chair and vice chair identify a theme for the coming year. Tammy and I have identified feedback and fulfillment forward for the next 150. The feedback component builds on last year's theme of communication and is vital to allow us to identify the pain points as well as the positives. We are curious about patterns and identifying the issues that are most meaningful to our faculty. Later this fall, faculty across the university and medical center will receive a brief, and I promise brief, less than 10 minute survey that we ask you to complete in order to gather this information. We know that faculty are more likely to provide their honest views to their peers, so this de-identified survey will be analyzed within the Faculty Senate. This survey will allow us to prioritize the needs our faculty feel are important to enhancing their work environment and their experience. 
ultimately leading to optimal fulfillment and productivity in their work. These findings will be shared with the full Senate and be communicated to the Chancellor and Provost. We look forward to working with them on efforts to enhance feelings of fulfillment across our institution, knowing that this leads to greater flourishing, leaving Vanderbilt even better for those who follow us into the next 150 years. In addition to our standing committee work, we will also be considering a review and, if needed, update to our definition and description of academic freedom. An ad hoc committee will be convened to consider what the core of liberal arts means at Vanderbilt for our undergraduates, considering that we have four very, very different undergraduate serving schools. Tammy and I look forward to working with all of you as we serve the faculty and work with the administration in the coming year. Your senators and the executive committee are here for you. We encourage you to engage with us. Our first Senate meeting is on Thursday, September 7th at 4.10 p.m. in the beautiful Faculty Commons building on 19th Avenue. All faculty are welcome and encouraged to attend. In addition to the Faculty Senate meetings and events like this assembly, there will be other opportunities for connections. Next month, the Faculty Senate will co-host a workshop with the Divisions of Government and Community Relations and Communications and Marketing to update participants on how Vanderbilt currently advocates on behalf of the university. At this event, they will share best practices and ideas to ensure that faculty members who want to advocate on topics of interest to them are equipped to persuade others. More information about this workshop, which is going to be a chance to learn from and listen to each other, will be shared in the next few weeks. Please do not hesitate to reach out to your senators anyone on the executive committee or to me with any thoughts or concerns this year. We truly are here for you. It's a, tradi it's a tradition for us to hear from both the chancellor and provost during each fall assembly. So it is now my pleasure to introduce Chancellor Deermeyer, an internationally renowned political science scientist and management scholar. Daniel Deermeyer is the ninth chancellor of Vanderbilt University. Since joining Vanderbilt in 2020, Chancellor Deermeyer has led an ambitious program of growth and advancement. Under his visionary leadership, the university has risen in stature, successfully launched a record $3.2 billion capital campaign, topped the $1 billion mark in research funding for the first time in the university's history, and reaffirmed its long-standing commitment to free expression and civil discourse. He has driven efforts to create a culture of radical collaboration and personal growth for Vanderbilt's faculty, students, and staff, and to expand Vanderbilt's global presence. Before arriving at Vanderbilt, Chancellor Deermeyer served in leadership and faculty roles at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, and at the University of Chicago, where he served as Dean of the Harris School of Public Policy and subsequently as Provost. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Guggenheim Foundation. He has published five books and more than 100 research articles, primarily in the fields of political science, economics, and management. Throughout his career, Deermeyer has been an advisor to governments, nonprofits, and leading companies, mostly in the area of crisis management. And with that, Chancellor Deermeyer. Well, thank you, Professor Capizzi, for this wonderful introduction. And uh, I first want to thank you all for braving the tropical heat to be here. Nothing more important than the faculty fall assembly. So uh, you made that commitment. And then I have to say, um, no better way to start the fall semester than with some Schubert. And, uh, you know, to have uh, Sion and uh, uh, Dashaun uh, do their wonderful rendition here was just wonderful. And, uh, you know, Dietrich Fischer, Dieska, and Gerald Moore, you have nothing on us. So, um, how wonderful that was. Well, with that, Professor Raver, Provost, esteemed faculty, honored guests, thank you for making this time to be here today. Um, I'm delighted and proud to start this new academic year with you. As you know, the Faculty Senate, in conjunction with our model, of shared governance is among the most 
important exemplars of the collaborative culture that makes Vanderbilt University unlike any other. Our coming together for this fall faculty assembly is an important tradition that reaffirms that spirit. And as always, it's my great pleasure to later join you in honoring your colleagues who are receiving our annual fall awards. Always a highlight. 149 autumns have passed since our university was founded. This is the 150th. And I can confidently say that Vanderbilt has never been in a stronger position than it is today. It is stronger by every measure than it has ever been. Financially, we're more sound than at any time in our history. Uh, at the value of our endowment uh, is now just, just close to $10 billion, depending on what day of the week you check. And uh, as you just heard, thanks to our generous alumni, the fiscal year 2023 was our single largest fundraising year ever. And we're not m fudging with the numbers here. So for among the economists in here, that's in real dollars, okay? Uh, <laughs> Almost 50% almost more than the best year we've ever had. Really incredible, the support that we've received last year. And these resources, of course, allow us to invest in your work and the transformative education you provide to our students every day. We enroll our most qualified undergraduate class ever with the highest yield, the highest selectivity, and the highest ACT and SAT average, averages ever recorded. Represented in this room and beyond is our most accomplished and expert faculty ever. Some of the world's most former scholars, thinkers, innovators, and creators. And our research enterprise, along with our capacity for translating our discoveries into real world application, continues to thrive. Combined external research funding for Vanderbilt and Vanderbilt University Medical Care Center exceeded $1 billion for the second year in a row now, ahead of places such as MIT, Northwestern, and the University of Chicago. And I had two former employers of mine listed in there just for fun. Our Center for Technology Transfer and Commercialization, which is the place that, that, that takes the innovations that are generated by our faculty and puts them into the real world, ranked, ranked sixth in the nation for technology licensing revenue in, last, in fiscal year 2022, surpassing Stanford and MIT. We're bound to place in the top 10 for fiscal year 2023, again, because last year the CTTC earned $96 million, a new record and the most licensing revenue it ever had in its history. No matter where we look, all indicators that we can see a pointing upward, and sometimes upward in a dramatic fashion. But while we here at Vanderbilt are thriving, the same cannot be said about higher education in general. Higher education is facing unprecedented criticism aimed at institutions at all levels and from all sides of the political spectrum, including elite private universities like ours. In June, the US Supreme Court ruled that race-conscious admissions practices violate the Constitution. Like many of you, I was deeply disappointed by the court's decision. In my view, a university must be able to enroll the students that allow it to best serve its mission and to deliver an outstanding educational experience for all. Diversity is essential to dialogue, learning, innovation, and growth for every member of our community, and Vanderbilt will always recruit a wide and deep pool of applicants consistent with our academic mission and our core value of equal opportunity for all. The court's decision makes that more difficult for universities, but that said, we will continue the work to build diverse incoming classes and create an environment of belonging for each of them while complying, of course, with the law. A university task force working closely with the Office of the General Counsel is reviewing 
new federal guidelines related to the court's decisions that were just issued a couple of weeks ago, and will make recommendations on how best to adapt our practices. But the Supreme Court decision is only one of the challenges facing higher education this fall. On its heels are debates about legacy admissions, the future of college athletics, spending levels at public university, university endowments, and the list goes on. Everybody, it seems, has an opinion on how to run a university better. Consider just one case, the case of endowments. Commentators, some very prominent, have argued that one simple solution for improving accessibility at elite institutions is for us to simply spend our endowments to increase student numbers. This seems like a perfectly simple and reasonable solution unless you know how universities actually work. An endowment, contrary to popular belief, is not a massive bank account that can be drawn on for whatever university wants. It consists literally of, th of over, I think it's almost 3,000 funds, often restricted by donors to specific purposes. And spending is also governed by strict government rules and fiduciary obligations. For example, endowment funds that are intended to support students must be used to support students. Endowment funds intended to support research must be used to support research. And universities already use all their endowment funds dedicated to supporting students for financial aid. Indeed, many, including Vanderbilt, further beyond what is available in the endowment, invest in making college affordable for all. We have significantly increased student aid over the past 20 years. In this academic year alone, we will spend about $170 million from our general funds to defray the cost of attendance for our students, accounting for 62% of undergraduate financial aid overall. What this translates to is that families making up to $130,000 a year in annual income can generally can expect to pay less to attend Vanderbilt than to pay an in-state tuition for the University of Tennessee. Let that sink in for a moment, okay? And of course, less than out-of-state tuition at most of the highly ranked public universities. For almost a quarter of our domestic undergraduates receiving aid, Vanderbilt provides the aid equivalent to the entire cost of attendance. And while it is tempting to think that opening the doors to more students is the easy fix, unless additional funding is available, dramatically increasing the student body, of course, will also dramatically reduce our ability to invest in our students, and thus dramatically dilute the transformative experience we provide at Vanderbilt every day. You can see I feel pretty strongly about this. And of course, education is only part of a research university's mission. Research must be funded as well. And contrary to popular belief, federal grants never cover the total bill of research. Many private universities, including Vanderbilt, spend sizable fractions of their endowment on faculty research between 20 and 40% of an endowment's value. And that spending typically covers 25% of the research cost. So to put it differently, when you get an award, we add 25% in order to make the research possible. These funds do more than fuel your work. A conservative estimate has recently shown that every dollar invested in research yields at least $5 in social gains. Tremendous return for investing in research. Redirecting research funds to undergrad education alone would result in the knowledge and innovations, in the loss of the knowledge of innovations that benefit all 
and would effectively destroy the research mission of the great universities. And these insights and the ability to support our students and our research potently remind us about the value of philanthropy. Because without philanthropy, we couldn't make any of these investments. And of course, philanthropy is also much maligned of late. The fact is, supporting world-class research university is a tremendously smart move. One that has tremendous social benefits, whether for students or for the world at large. Research universities have for decades been the engines of America's innovation economy and competitiveness. And despite domestic criticism, we are still where America turns for insights into the human conditions or for solutions to seemingly intractable problems. For not just answers, but for solutions. Here at Vanderbilt, we are increasingly fueling your work with philanthropy, and that's the whole point of the Dare to Grow campaign. Philanthropy allows us to invest in you and in our students. And our record here demonstrates the tremendous support of the Vanderbilt community and the confidence and trust in our mission. Headwinds from criticism can make our work more difficult. But we are moving forward, nonetheless, as Vanderbilt always has, with faith in our values, in our mission, and in our shared purpose. Our motto, after all, is Crest Seri Audi, dare to grow. It reminds us that growth requires courage and must be earned. So in this, our sesquicentennial year, we continue to pursue our vision of being nothing less than the great university of the 21st century. For we need to remember, we are all together as one community engaged in a noble mission. So we'll continue to explain and demonstrate the immense social value of research university like ours to advocate for these marvelous institutions that are criticized here at home, yet they are the envy of the world. We'll continue to advocate for increased funding for research and for additional student support. And we will continue to lead by example. First, we will continue to expand our global presence. In May, Provost Raver and I appointed the university's Global Strategy Committee, which includes faculty from all 10 colleges and school. We charged the committee with pursuing bold proposals to advance the university's scholarship, reputation and impact, enhance the student experience, and boost recruiting of global talent. The committee's hard work is already coming to fruition. And we will have several exciting announcements of projects to, to share later this year. In the meantime, we launched our Global Scholars and Residence program in December. We brought more than 700 students from 92 countries to our campus for the Clinton Global Initiative University in March. And international undergraduate students from the Davis United World Scholars Program began studying in our campus as part of this year's incoming class. To fully support your work and to realize our ambition as a university, increasing our global presence and connections is essential. It is the top of my and Provost Raver's priorities every day. Second, we will embrace more closely, even more closely, our signature practice and value of radical collaboration. As any of you who have been at other universities can attest, our culture is already like no other in terms of how we collaborate and support one another. We are not cutthroat here. We know the best way to succeed as individuals and as a university is by working together. But radical cooperation also means working across all boundaries in unexpected ways. This means we'll increasingly ask you to partner with colleagues working in other disciplines or with external partners and nonprofits, governments, and businesses. We already do such an excellent job in this. There are countless examples 
large and small, every day. But to realize our aspirations, we must do more. And finally, we will continue our commitment to free expression and civil discourse. This is fundamental to who we are here at Vanderbilt. We have believed from our beginning, from the founding of this university, in the power of bringing people of differing viewpoints together in common purpose. Free expression rests on three pillars, open forests, institutional neutrality, and civil discourse. Open, forests are the main, open forums are the many spaces on campus where issues can be discussed without the threat of censorship. Institutional neutrality is the commitment that I and all of our senior leaders make to not take public positions on controversial issues unless the issue is directly related to the functioning of the university. And I want to be clear here. Institutional neutrality does not obligate you to be silent on any issue. On the contrary, the aim of institutional neutrality is to allow the greatest possible space for your voices and for those of your students, by avoiding any signal that there's a preferred point of view or party line at our university. We want you to speak up and we will encourage and support you to do so and argue with the courage of your convictions. And the university staff and resources are here to help you and support you. The practice of institutional neutrality is an acknowledgement that the role of a university is to encourage debates, not to settle them. And I'll invite you to a faculty salon hosted by the Faculty Senate on August 28, where we will discuss this issue in more depth. The third pillar of free expression at Vanderbilt is civil discourse. The practice of engaging in conversation and debate in a constructive manner that demonstrates respect for those on the other side of an issue. Civil discourse, importantly, does not mean that we agree, but it is vital that we listen closely to one another and seriously consider whether an opposing view might have value. For constructive discussion and debate is at the very heart of education, scholarship, research, and innovation. It is also essential for pluralistic democratic government and for living a fulfilling life. Yesterday, as our next step in this journey, we launched an initiative called Dialogue Vanderbilt. The Dialogue Vanderbilt, we teach first year students and other members of our university community how to engage in constructive conversation. We'll conduct research on polarization and we'll use what we will learn to help restore civil discourse in our society. One of the most important things we are doing with Dialogue Vanderbilt is giving our undergraduate students the skills to discuss and debate with each other respectfully without rushing to righteousness or shrinking from the challenge so that they are prepared for the complicated and polarized world beyond campus. I hope you'll find Dialogue Vanderbilt helpful in your classrooms and anywhere else, you and your students and colleagues way opposing and challenging ideas. And I hope you'll help us model constructive, fact-based conversations for our students in the best of the great university tradition. As we go into the 150s Vanderbilt autumn, it is worth reminding ourselves that our work serves a higher purpose. And like any such work, it is not easy. But we persist because we know it is the right thing to do. Because the enduring values that guide us as a university compel us to do that work, and because so much good comes from that work. Amid the swirling winds of change and criticism, and in the face of uncertainty, doing our work, doing your work, demands courage. I want to thank you for that courage, the courage you show daily 
as you so generously and well teach your students, as you strike out for the unknown in your scholarship, research, and creative pursuits, as you consistently demonstrate excellence in higher education at a moment when so many seem not to understand or appreciate what that means. And I want to encourage you to go even further. I want to embolden you to dare even more. Whatever your discipline, whatever your pursuit, Provost Braver and I encourage you not only to think in terms of small advances, but to understand bold goals that redefine what is possible. We don't just want Vanderbilt to be renowned in the world. We want Vanderbilt to change the world. Society's challenges are many. They are urgent, and they are complex and difficult. They will not be met by timid half measures or old ways of doing things. Remember our motto, dare to grow. It calls us to show courage, courage to ask hard questions, courage to challenge conventional wisdom, courage to follow the evidence, even and especially when it is contrary to common beliefs, courage to insist on reason and thoughtful arguments when emotions and opinions seem to rule and courage to instill these values in our students, the next generation entrusted to us. Thank you for all you do at Vanderbilt every day. Your work has never been more important. Pursue it with courage, with pride, and with joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Deermeyer. It is now my pleasure to introduce Provost Raver. C. Sibel Raver serves as the Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Vanderbilt University, an esteemed developmental psychologist whose leadership has spanned research, academic, and administrative settings. Provost Raver oversees all faculty, staff, programs, and initiatives for Vanderbilt's 10 schools and colleges. Raver is a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science and is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Psychology and Human Development at Peabody College. Prior to her tenure at Vanderbilt, she was Deputy Provost at New York University. She has held faculty positions at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy and Cornell University's Department of Human Development. Throughout her career, she has received prestigious awards from the American Psychological Association and the William T. Grant Foundation, and has been granted support from the MacArthur Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Spencer Foundation, in which she garnered more than $24 million in funding. Provost Raver. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you to our Vice Provost of Faculty Affairs, Tracy George, and also to her team, and most importantly, thank you to all of you for being here. As your Provost and Chief Academic Officer, it's such a thrill each year to be uh, celebrating with you uh, this moment. I really want to thank Chancellor Deermeyer for serving as such an inspiring leader and partner as we pursue this vision of transforming higher education. That is so incredibly bold, and we mean it so sincerely and with such great confidence. With you, we aim to set the defining standard for the power of rigorous research, innovation, and education to benefit the economic and social fabric of our nation and our world. And to do that, I need each of you. I need all of you. Brilliant, creative, scholarly leaders, investigators, teachers, instructors, contributors, and innovators. Each of you does cutting edge work. That's what brought you to Vanderbilt. That's what keeps you at Vanderbilt. 
It is that future that you see and the future of your fields as well as the future of the next generation of students that inspires you and to whom you have committed so much. But you might ask, what leads me to be so confident in this vision that Daniel Dermeyer and I have outlined or are outlining? And what, why am I so confident in this vision that we have set out? Well, I've been here for two years, and I've spent a lot of time looking at and reading and listening to your work and con communicating and talking with you and talking to others about you. You have served with me on committees, task forces, decanal searches. I've visited your classes, your departments, your town halls. Um, I know that this faculty is extraordinarily excited to take risk and so ready to lean in to the power of discovery. And it was from that estimate, from my read of all of your work, that I was inspired by your talent and your ambition so much that I launched the university initiative last year called Discovery Vanderbilt. And it built on Opportunity Vanderbilt, to which the chancellor just spoke so beautifully in making the opportunity for all students to be here, and Destination Vanderbilt, the idea that we bring the best and the brightest to Vanderbilt, building on that, what can we all collectively discover? Not simply in research, but also in supporting tra the training of students and understanding that the best pedagogy is when we train them to discover, rather than to simply pass back to us canonical knowledge that we've given to them. And through Discovery Vanderbilt, Padma Raghavan, our Vice Provost of Research and Innovation, and your deans and associate deans of research, and I have been working shoulder to shoulder to make it easier for you to pursue your boldest research questions, to support you in thinking through licensing and patenting and other forms of tech transfer, to get your ideas into the marketplace, and providing you with technical support as you apply for awards and funding to pilot and scale your most innovative ideas and curricula for ways to mentor and teach. So less than one year later, where are we? Have these bold ambitions and these grand claims been you know, essentially certified? Can I actually give you evidence for where we stand? Well, as an empirical quantitative social scientist, I hold myself to that standard, and I would expect you to hold me to that standard too. I'll say that based on the premise that we miss 100% of the shots that we don't take, right? I'm not a kid who grew up playing basketball, it was pre-Title IX, but I've been taught this phrase of, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, that makes sense, I watch basketball, I get it. I look at how often do you all take the shot? How often do you apply for federal or state or private foundation funding or support for your teaching? And I am really, really deeply moved to see that our faculty applied for over 1,300 grants and awards in the last year, going from a steady state in grant seeking to actually a significant increase. You all increased the number of middle-sized grants, which I think of as about $1.5 to $5 million in funding, by 21%. And you increased large grants over $5 million in funding, suggesting that you're going after really complex, bold ideas, particularly in the sciences and engineering, of course, but we know that big grants uh, in the humanities, though they are numerically smaller, are equally important. We see a full 33% increase in the number of those very large grants. So what does that tell me? That tells me that you are more ambitious, more emboldened, that you are swinging with a bigger bat, to mix my sports metaphors, which is probably a terrible idea, pursuing bolder and more complex projects. You're hitting it out of the park, essentially, on individual and collective success and securing those awards. But as my colleague Jennifer Pietenpaul says, it's not really about the money. We know that research is not costless, but it's really about the impact. And that's what I want you to take away from today. Today, we're looking at how much you're going for it. In the next few years, we're gonna be looking at what is the impact of your scholarly effort. And I would love your input and your ideas for how we actually estimate that. So in thinking about that, we are not only thinking about it in terms of how exciting it is to me as your provost, but how strategically smart it is. We're moving up dramatically in terms of our rankings, but that also allows us to continue to recruit and retain the world's most stellar talent and contributes to this incredible, vibrant ecosystem of which you are so central and of such a part. 
So with that, I want to give a quick plug to say keep your eye out for Vice Provost Raghavan's Innovation Catalyst Fund because we look in, in similar ways at innovation and at tech transfer as an opportunity to leverage the marketplace to have the largest impact possible regarding your scholarship. And on the teaching front, you are demonstrating the same level of stellar ambition, dedication, and collaboration. I had a fantastic window, window into this in the last 24 hours. So in the last 24 hours, I visited Professor Slayton's course on syntax and music, which was brilliant. It was on composition. Very, very cool. I got a chance to go to Dr. Hare's course on organic chemistry and arts and science, where I literally heard one student saying to another student, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited for this course. Right? I mean, for Orgo, that is amazing. Um, and I had a chance to attend a Nashville business breakfast with, I'd say, about 40 business leaders, many of whom were CEOs, many of whom were Owen grads, including uh, a faculty member, uh, Kelly Goldsmith was there, um, who actually would come up to me unprompted to say, I loved my experience at Owen. That's the kind of energy that you all are generating and supporting as you train the next genera of leadership. As you develop a powerhouse core curriculum for undergraduates, as Sarah Igo and so many other faculty have done in arts and science, or as you work so successfully with Amy Johnson and Tiffany Tung to scale up immersion experience. As just one spotlight of that, I read in my VU the ways that one of our seniors, JJ Johnson, who's graduating obviously uh, in the spring, had not only pursued his lab assistant role in Stephen Townsend's lab in chemistry, but had also completed his immersion project by writing poetry through the creative of writing program in arts and science, and I see that Major Jackson is here, and is now completing a chemical engineering internship, and I'm thrilled that Chris Roy, our new dean, is here, um, while also pursuing extracurricularly ballet. Now, like, that is so beautiful and so amazing and so incredibly powerful in terms of thinking about really generating this wide, broad-minded powerhouse leaders for the next generation. It's true when you partner with Dave Owen at the Wondery to support students' emerging leadership as founders and social entrepreneurs, or when you provide me with recommendations on how to extend our global reach in attracting and training some of the best graduate student candidates from other nations with Bunmi Olatanji and Andre Christine Mizell in the graduate school. In short, today gives me an opportunity to emphasize how far we have come, but really, truly, how exciting it is for us to move forward. So let me just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about how we move forward together. As the chancellor mentioned during his remarks, this is not only a tough time for higher education in terms of public sentiment. It's also more challenging to lead as a university in this post-affirmative action, post-Dobbs world. I want to be clear as Vanderbilt's provost that our commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging remain unwavering. I lead from the principle that to do our best work and to make our best decisions, we need every voice at the table. We need each of you and all of you at that table. A demonstrated track record of walking the walk on strengthening institutional diversity and ensuring a sense of belonging for all members of our community and particularly for those of us from marginalized and minoritized communities is fundamental to our values and fundamental to the way we work and will continue to be so. It's fundamental to our most effective uh, efforts in training the next generation of leaders and to carrying out our best scholarship and our best creative inquiry. So how are we continuing to walk the walk? What is the temperature or the data that I would give you on that front? We're making sure that our values of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are being implemented and integrated through all aspects of faculty, academic, and student affairs throughout the office of the provost and throughout each school. So just as a, quick, a few quick examples, it's of highest priority in the Office of Faculty Affairs, as indicated by uh, our hire recently in January, prior to all of the SCOTUS decisions, um, of an Associate Provost for Faculty Development, Dwayne Watson, who's hired not only because of his tremendous expertise in faculty advancement, but his expertise in faculty advancement for underrepresented uh, faculty or from underrepresented groups. We also had the opportunity to promote um, our wonderful colleague, uh, uh, sorry, I totally lost my space where I am on here, oh, Jermaine Soto, of course, um, in his leadership in faculty advancement. 
To ensure the same sense of belonging is being built into our um, Office for Student Affairs, GL Black, Vice Provost for Student Affairs and Dean of Students is currently hiring an Assistant Director of Student Life for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And Tiffany Tung, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education is also hiring a Senior Director of Academic Opportunity and Belonging. These positions will strive to champion EDI and our principles of inclusiveness and collaborative community throughout all students' experience. And I could give you longer lists, but I don't think it's necessary I just want this to be really clear, that they stand as bright examples of our continued and increased dedication. We believe the more equity, inclusion, and opportunity are really creating space for pe more people at the table, it gives us greater capacity for higher caliber and more uh, really, truly, deeply impactful uh, work across both our research and our teaching missions. It ensures that this culture is instilled in every aspect of Vanderbilt University, and it's not only our responsibility as human beings, but necess necessary for us to advance our mission as a university and as a leader in higher ed. So in closing, I want to emphasize how much these pillars of discovery, of dialogue, and of diversity, inclusion, and belonging place us in such a powerful position as we think about how to transform higher education in the years ahead. In this time of skepticism and uncertainty, we have the opportunity to step into that breach and actually lead in a moment uh, that I think where the ground is a little bit uncertain. Uh, unstable, and we can and do have tremendous social and economic impact on our cities, on our region and the world. This is now the time to actually make that manifest and absolutely clear. I cannot wait to see what we accomplish together in this academic year, and I so deeply thank you. Thank you so much, Provost Raver. So many thanks to both Provost Raver and Chancellor Deermeyer for sharing their thoughts as we begin this new academic year. In the past, we would now engage in another tradition of the faculty assembly, the recognition of our colleagues who have served 25 years at Vanderbilt. This is an important tradition and one we will continue doing, but this has been moved to the spring faculty assemblies moving forward. I have been assured that the chairs that go along with the 25th celebration will also be continued. So no worries about that. Um, I cannot wait to celebrate the 25 years of service of everyone since our last recognition when we gather again in the spring. But now we move to another tradition of the fall faculty assembly, the presentation of awards. I invite Chancellor Deermeyer to come forward to tell us about each award while Pro Provost Raver and I present the awards. Chancellor Deermeyer. We will begin with the Chancellor's Awards for research, which recognize excellence in works of research scholarship and creative expression published or presented in the last three calendar years. This year we are presenting five awards to five faculty members. The first recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Research is Jonathan Brown, Associate Professor of Medicine. Jonathan was nominated by Kim and Rathmill for his article in vivo adenine base editing rescues Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome, published in the journal Nature. Now, when you listen to this, you think like, not obvious, okay? <laughs> not obvious, but remember how I told you about the tremendous impact that the work of our faculty has. So, children with Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome suffer horrible disease. It's a premature aging condition and children die at a median age of 14 from heart attacks and strokes. Currently, there's only palliative care drug treatments for these children. Jonathan's landmark paper describes life-changing treatments for this fatal disease and is already having a broad impact in the gene therapy community. 
The quality and comprehensive nature of his study have influenced how investigators are evaluating DNA editing. I just like, I think just a wonderful example of exactly what we were talking about earlier. And of course, Jonathan has received accolades already for this paper, including the 2023 Vanderbilt Biomedica Prize that advances science and changing lives. Congratulations, Jonathan. Next, I am delighted to honor Jefferson Coey. James C. Stallman Professor of History. Jeff was nominated by Emily Grable for his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Freedom's Dominion, a saga of white resistance to federal power. The Pulitzer, word, the Pulitzer Board had this to say in praise of Jeff's work. This book radically shifts our understanding of what freedom means in America. It is a resonant account of an Alabama county in the 19th and 20th centuries shaped by settler colonialism and slavery, a portrait that illustrates the evolution of white supremacy by drawing powerful connections between anti-government and racist ideologies, and a riveting history of the long-running clash between white people and federal authority. As Jeff has noted, although this is only the story of one county, there's much to learn about an entire country's need for a vigorous commitment to our democratic institutions. Congratulations, Jeff. Our next recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Research is Catherine Humphreys. Associate Professor of Psychology and Human Development. <clears throat> Catherine was nominated by Dean Camilla Benbow for her piece, Child Maltreatment and Depression, a meta-analysis of studies using the Childhood, Childhood Trauma Questionnaire, published in Child Abuse and Neglect and selected as that journal's 2020 article of the year. Depression, of course, is a significant public health concern and a leading cause of disability worldwide. Understanding the causes for depression is crucial for reducing the risk for this debilitating disorder. Catherine studies works with a widely used dimensional measure of child maltreatment, the Childhood Trauma Questionnaire. By conducting a meta-analysis, the study documents that the severity of stressful experience in early life is associated with increased risk of depression in adulthood. This study is the largest to examine the association between child maltreatment and depression using a single measure. Congratulations, Catherine. We are also proud to recognize Douglas Rutherford, Associate Professor of Medicine with the Chancellor's Award for Research. <laughs> Douglas is a, is a, is a, looks like he's a victim of the heat, but I'll, I'll tell you anyway what he did. He was nominated by Kerman Rathmel for his article, Phenotypic Signatures and Clinical Data Enabling Systemic Identifications of patients for genetic testing, which was published in Nature Medicine. Around 5% of the population is affected by a rare genetic disease, yet most people endure years of uncertainty before receiving a genetic test. This work provides a comprehensive design to identify patients likely to benefit from genetic testing based only on diagnostic codes from electronic health records, much easier available. It demonstrates that patterns representing a wide range of genetic diseases can be captured 
from electronic health records to systematize decision-making for genetic testing, and thus to provide the potential to speed up diagnostics, improve care, and reduce costs. Compared to the current standard, this model would allow many more genetic disease patients to be identified much earlier in the course of care. Doc, going once, going twice, going third. Congratulations, Doc. Our final recipient, I know it's her, because I've seen her already. Final recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Research is Alison Schachter. <laughs> Alison is professor of Jewish studies and professor of English. She was nominated by Jennifer Fay for her book, Women Writing Jewish Modernity, 1919 to 1939. Through meticulous archival research, Allison situates five women authors in world political and biographical history and upends the idea that Jewish literary modernity was a conversation among men about women, with a few women writers listening in. Instead, women writers revolutionized the very terms of Jewish fiction at a pivotal moment in Jewish history. This book tells their story, and in doing so, calls for a new way of thinking about Jewish literary history that incorporates women's voices. Allison's comparative approach helps us to appreciate that bigger picture and teaches its, lead, its readers why literary history matters and how the history of modernism could have unfolded differently. Congratulations, Allison. I will now present the Chancellor Awards for Research on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. This is an honor that we're presenting to two faculty members this year. This award recognizes excellence in published research, scholarship, or creative expression that advances our understanding of equity, diversity, and inclusion. The first award goes to Alison Anall, Assistant Professor of Political Science. Alison brought her fan club and was nominated <laughs> by Brett Benson for her book, The Obligation Mosaic, Race and Social Norms in U.S. Political Participation, published by the University of Chicago Press. In The Obligation Mosaic, Alison investigates how different racial communities develop norms of political participation. Through interviews, surveys, and experiments with Asian, Black, Latino, and white Americans, she identifies two norms that define concepts of obligation, honoring ancestors and helping those in need. These obligations may bring people into the political world or not, depending on distinct group histories and experiences. For example, the power of these norms helps black Americans overcome resource deficits that otherwise would reduce or would have reduced their participation in politics elucidating a level of participation that is higher than conventional models would predict. This work reorients our understanding how group norms matter for political participation with implications for political representation and engagement in America and opportunities for change. This year, the Obligation Mosaic also won the prestigious Gillette and Alexander L. George Outstanding Political Psychology Book Award from the International Society of Political Psychology. Congratulations, Alison. <laughs> Second Chancellor Award for Research on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion goes to, and I know she's here as well, because I've seen her already, Consuelo Wilkins, Professor of Medicine. <laughs> Q 
Consuela was nominated, you guessed it, by Kim Moon Rathmill for her work, Racial and Ethnic Dif Differences in Amyloid PET Positivity in Individuals with Mild Cognitive Impairment or Dementia, published in JAMA Neurology. This study investigates racial and ethnic differences in a biomarker of Alzheimer's, amyloid levels in the brain indicated in PET scans. The, study findings, the study's findings show lower rates of this marker among black and Hispanic people, despite their higher rates of dementia. This may reflect differences in the cause of cognitive impairment for these populations, such as underlying vascular disease or social factors that impact health. There are far-reaching implications for patients and their families if new treatments based on lowering the amyloid PET signal are less effective because the patients are less likely to have positivity. This study has potential to impact policy, health, by pointing to the urgency of understanding the underlying causes of memory loss in racially and ethnically diverse communities. Congratulations, Consuelo. Our next award is the Thomas Jefferson Award, which honors a faculty member for distinguished service to Vanderbilt through extraordinary contribution as a member of the faculty in the councils and government of the university. The recipient of this year's Thomas Jefferson Award is Catherine McTammany. Catherine is Associate Professor of the Practice of Teaching and Learning. She was recommended for this award through the Faculty Senate. She has served the university in many roles during her 17 year career here at Vanderbilt. Most notably, she's been a member of the Faculty Senate since 2018 and served as chair during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Catherine and I had spent a lot of quality time together during this time. <laughs> her compassionate and sound leadership and her fortitude during this unprecedented time were critical. She facilitated communication among the faculty. She engaged stakeholders to address the needs of students, faculty, and staff, and she worked tirelessly to deal with the challenges affecting the Vanderbilt community. After completing her tenure as faculty senate chair, she took on another important leadership role as faculty, as chair of the faculty senate grievance committee, not an easy task, a position she currently holds. Catherine also is a triple door, meaning she has, made, she has earned her bachelor, master, and doctorate at Vanderbilt. That's the quadruple crown, Catherine, okay? Thank you, Catherine, for bringing hard work, dedication, and deep knowledge of the Vanderbilt experience to your work and service to the university. Congratulations. Chris was nominated for this award by Dean Chris Guthrie. By all measures, Chris is one of the most influential criminal law professors in the country, gaining national recognition and international acclaim beyond the legal community with his interdisciplinary work that connects criminal justice, psychology, and science. <coughs> his research focuses on broad problems in criminal law, from his early focus on appropriate use of expertise in, court, in courts to his current work on the ethical implications of the possibility of predicting criminality. The impact and volume of his work are impressive. Seven books and more than 200 articles on topics relating to criminal law and procedure, mental health law and evidence, 170 citations by US state and federal courts talk about impact, and he's also been cited in five different U.S. Supreme Court decisions. Chris has also appeared on Good Morning America, <laughs> The Today Show, National Public Radio, and other popular media outlets, sharing his research with a wide audience. Through his incisive and prodigious scholarly work and his broad engagement, 
He is shaping the national conversation on vital topics including search and surveillance, AI, and criminal procedure, and mass incarceration. Chris, my sincere congratulations on this tremendous honor. Please join me in one more round of applause for our honorees today. Wow, I feel like I need to go do lots more work um, after hearing all that. I have some phenomenal colleagues. Um, as we conclude, I'd like to thank you all for being here. If you are presented with an award, um, please make your way back up to the stage for a group photo. Um, everyone else, thank you so much for attending, and I invite you to join us in the Board of Trust room for a reception. So the reception is inside, thankfully, not outside, and the Board of Trust room is this way. Thank you all so much, and have a great academic year. Thank you.